I am truly very honored to be able uh, to be here today uh, to speak to everyone. I was uh, just told that this is actually a regular event, the inaugural conference of the Palais de Chaillot, and this is truly a great honor. This is actually the third time that I speak here. The first time was in 2007, and every two years I have had a chance to speak again, which in fact makes things increasingly difficult for me because each time there are more and more people who have actually heard me before. How do you ensure that you can make your presentation a little different each time? It puts even more pressure on you. However, this is an opportunity for me to talk a little about uh, uh, my experience uh, and my thinking about architecture in more depth. I've had opportunities uh, to talk uh, with all of you before about the very close connections there are with Chinese traditions. And there are some profoundly Chinese things which are not very easy uh, to uh, describe. And I will try to go into a little more depth about these things today. Essentially, over uh, the past uh, 10 years uh, or so, I have been uh, working in uh, this uh, direction on the basis of looking at uh, the way the world is going. Uh, because, uh, in fact, the world is evolving in ways which go opposite to what I am trying to achieve. I would like to have more diversity, more differentiation in the world, but it would seem that all things are moving in the opposite direction. At uh, Amateur Architecture Studio, uh, we work, of course, in China. And many people have uh, an image, a mental image of China, which is somewhat different from reality. So perhaps we should start by looking at uh, what China is actually like today. This is a picture from a thousand years ago of Hangzhou as it stood then. That is what a city looked like. And you may say, well, this is just a landscape. How can you talk about uh, a town? But it was actually the way that it looked. This is uh, where Hangzhou is uh, located. Many people are not familiar with Hangzhou, but it is essential to know about it if you want to understand Chinese culture. Beijing is the political center, the commercial center is Shanghai, Guangzhou, uh, Canton could be uh, perhaps uh, the center for exports, but in terms of tradition, Hangzhou has always been the cultural center, and uh, it has a tremendous uh, importance from the point of view of the spirit and of uh, tradition. Here you can see uh, the current aspect of Hangzhou. This is uh, a place where I came some 30 years ago, and it looked like what you see at the bottom here. I absolutely fell in love with it and decided to stay, but of course I had no idea what it would look like some 30 years later. In the space of 30 years, this is the magnitude of the changes which have taken place. And of course, there has been continuous debate and many divergences throughout about which direction the city should take. Uh, the whole of the city is uh, uh, very harmoniously integrated traditionally with the surrounding nature, so that, uh, in a sense, the huge changes which have taken place in Hangzhou have stepped over a line. People are not happy to see that the West Lake is surrounded by high-rise towers. It's a bit as if you built high-rise towers in Paris. So that's 
a particular experience. This is what Hangzhou looks like today. It has developed extremely fast, and you can see that uh, I've investigated uh, all around China and found that in many places this has been the case over the past 30 years. We have uh, destroyed up to 90% of our traditional buildings in the space of just a few decades. In the space of 30 years, 90% of the traditional buildings destroyed in many places. And this uh, is truly something which is essential in a country like China, which has thousands of years of history, to simply destroy your heritage to the tune of 90% in the space of 30 years is something which provides much food for thought. Over the past hundred years of successive uh, revolutionary upheavals, uh, we could say that uh, as Chinese uh, we have lost our trust and our love in our culture, or perhaps that those uh, who had love for their culture have effectively uh, disappeared in the course of all these successful movements, and we have focused exclusively, basically, on development. If you don't understand that, then it doesn't make any sense. It's simply crazy. If we look at uh, the immense changes which have taken place in ordinary Chinese people's lives, they have been forced to completely readjust their way of looking at things. So, where is China's development headed? I would say a simple answer is that it is headed towards becoming another America, a country that resembles America. If you look at uh, this view, for example, you might ask, well, is this really China? It looks like uh, an American city, but it is Hangzhou. And if you go into the city, you will see that because of the pace of development, old and new uh, buildings have come face to face or crowding in on each other. There is uh, something painful. It makes you angry uh, about this. But at the same time, when you think about it, there can be uh, very special changes which take place with this coexistence of the old and the new. Uh, to put it uh, bluntly, uh, for a thinking person, uh, this is uh, actually a very interesting development to see a, a country, uh, a city rather, being carved up into little pieces and developing so quickly gives rise to things that you have never seen before and that you would perhaps never see anywhere else. And that is food for thought. Hangzhou again and Hangzhou here. Is it Hong Kong, you might say? Is it Singapore? But it's Hangzhou. Of course, it's important in the course of urban development to have some form of model. And uh, we have drawn inspiration over time from Japan, from America, from Singapore, from Hong Kong. But ultimately, uh, in recent times, uh, the hottest uh, model has been Dubai, with a lot of officials going to uh, Dubai to take part in training courses uh, to see uh, how, in the space of a short time, uh, you could turn uh, China into uh, a country full of dazzling cities. This is not, Hang not Hong Kong either, it's Hangzhou again, and so is this. You can see uh, the way that uh, the city is spilling over into uh, the countryside, and everything is piled together haphazardly. But the fact is, and you'll see it if you look at this map, that uh, Hangzhou is a city which uh, uh, for some uh, thousand years uh, had been a very important model uh, in the Chinese context, partly 
mountain, partly town, partly landscape, and partly an urban context. And, and this is something which was a determining factor in the way it was structured. The two aspects of the urban context and the landscape worked hand in hand, and that was the traditional view. A thousand years ago, it was the capital of China. That was a time when there was protracted struggle between the Chinese and the Mongols, and that is when uh, some formative uh, views emerged. If you look, uh, for example, uh, at uh, the Forbidden City, uh, it has a West Lake nearby, uh, just like many other cities, and the Summer Palace also has gardens which are inspired from the model of Hangzhou. There are many West Lakes in various towns around China, which drew inspiration from Hangzhou's West Lake, which you see here. And it became a model. This is a map from the 1950s, at a time when uh, the city had barely budged. Uh, it was uh, uh, approximately uh, uh, one million people, and uh, that had been the case for approximately a thousand years. The scale of the city had not changed. And then suddenly we saw what you have just seen in all those photographs. Uh, this is the perimeter of the old city, and, and it still stood that way some 30 years ago, whereas now all around has become Hangzhou also. There has been explosive growth, like a big bang, uh, something uh, which uh, has multiplied the scale of the city by perhaps 10. And uh, there are now more than uh, 120 uh, cities around China, which are uh, beyond 1 million people, and about 2,100, which are above 100,000 people, which have all been through tremendous changes like this. So it's a very illustrative case. What about the countryside then? This is a construction of a highway, and this is what uh, the countryside looks like, far away in a remote mountainous area. This is what you find. So that the change has not been happening just in the city. It has been happening everywhere. Everyone wants new things, and uh, they don't need encourage encouragement from the outside. The change happens all the time. There are contradictions there, which are very marked. It's very difficult to define the direction taken by these changes in the countryside. The country and the city have always been uh, very clearly separated. Architects cannot work in a rural context because it's a totally separate system. So that in the countryside, unless there's government investment, the villagers themselves, the residents of the countryside themselves, are the ones who build, and uh, the architects have nothing to do with it. Because of this, the changes in the countryside are powered by the peasants uh, themselves, uh, who experiment uh, and uh, try things uh, in haphazard ways. Of course, in traditional China, this was not the case at all. There used to be a class of scholars, of uh, men of letters, and uh, uh, the shape of the countryside uh, was profoundly influenced by this scholar class. This is uh, an example of the kinds of uh, constructions uh, which have been invented by uh, peasants in the countryside. They are uh, quite striking. They look like uh, a secondary home. Uh, they have something of uh, Disneyland and also uh, elements uh, which uh, the owners themselves uh, have uh, invented. And looking at these pictures, of course, it's very difficult to imagine what China 
used to be like. This is a very moving thing to think about because of the very speed of change. When I was a child, China was not like that. What was China like in the past? It was in fact filled with a sense of poetry, to put it in simple words. This is what China was like. In the traditional sense, at least when we think about China and what it was like, this is what we imagine. This is also more than a thousand years ago a painting uh, which uh, illustrates uh, landscape painting at the time. It's not just landscape painting in the simple sense of the term. It is filled with philosophical aspects, uh, with uh, world view, uh, an essential impression of the world. The idea is to look for nature and to seek uh, what is the basis, uh, the what are the principles of nature. In Chinese culture, if we were to seek out what is most important, I think it's expressed very well by the painting we just saw. Uh, we talk about uh, nature, of course, but if we were to try uh, to actually experience nature. Of course, people can create things and they can uh, try to understand the principles of nature and create things which are very much in line with the principles of nature and which uh, coexist harmoniously with nature. That would be uh, the fundamental thinking. It's not so much that you come up with an idea and that everyone can simply apply it. Rather, it is the fruit of experience and generation after generation, you have to develop this experience and talk about these things. Now, of course, when we talk uh, about nature, it's a very interesting thing, in fact. When you think about it, nobody is in a position anymore to have a direct contact with nature. Of course, we love to talk about nature, but how do you go about actually seeing for yourself what nature is like, being confronted with it, learning from it? I think this is something which deserves to be called into question. There's an important term, the term of guanxiang, uh, which could be translated as contemplative meditation. The idea of guanxiang is uh, to try to look at nature in certain ways that will enable you uh, to capture its essence. It is not something that you can simply see uh, by looking. It's not as if it was simply there in front of you. You have to go beyond what you see. In fact, this calls for a particular way of looking at nature. And I thought that it would be useful to use examples from traditional Chinese painting to illustrate this. We have this traditional of landscape painting in China, which is something which really sets China apart from the rest of the world. Some 1,500 years ago or so, painting in China was very similar to what you might find in the West with characters, uh, historical or religious uh, figures, uh, uh, representations that were centered on human figures. Some 1,500 years ago, when China was engulfed in endless uh, warfare, gradually the idea emerged that perhaps human existence was not meaningful enough in and of itself, and that we should find something more meaningful, namely nature, and not uh, perhaps be bound by this perpetual strife by focusing on nature, so that there is a very a strong philosophical element in uh, the debates uh, 
uh, which took place around these questions. If you look at this painting here, you can see that it's uh, very unusual. It's only about this wide, but it's extremely long. It's uh, more than 11 meters long. So that if you were uh, to display it in a museum, essentially there's simply no way of looking at it. If you stand too far away, it's too small, you can't see. But if you get too close, then you can only see one part of it at a time. You can never gain an all-encompassing view. And if you think about it, that's exactly how the world is. If you look at the overall picture, there are many details that will escape your attention. Whereas if you focus in on something, you might lose sight of the overall picture. So how can you go about ensuring that even as you examine the details, you still bear in mind the larger picture? This is something uh, which is extremely important. The details uh, cannot be lost and the details uh, cannot represent the whole in and of themselves. This is a similar painting, a very long, uh, very wide painting. Different painters uh, from the same or from different eras have uh, similar approaches. We can see that there are tremendous changes within this picture, uh, but at the same time, many repetitions. It's an effort uh, to illustrate a common understanding. The question, the unifying question, is how humans can represent nature in such a way that the representation itself looks extremely natural. How do you make it so that something actually looks natural? That's the underlying question. Aha. Uh -huh. This doesn't seem to be working very smoothly. It was supposed to glide past harmoniously, but we can look at it like this too. I'm often surprised at the way that uh, these painters making these kinds of paintings do not uh, randomly uh, assign the relationships between the buildings and the landscape, but in fact the relationship between each building and the surrounding hills, or mountains or trees uh, is structured. All of this is also always very carefully thought out. And if we look at the history of architecture, I mean, these are uh, old pictures which illustrate the way uh, that architecture used to be. And we can also look at vertical painted scrolls, uh, such as uh, uh, the one you see here, uh, with uh, that feeling of looking up at something lofty uh, that rises high into the sky. We find this in many countries and also in China. In Chinese tradition, in fact, this has a lot to do uh, with architecture. Major buildings, uh, important homes, uh, large public buildings, as soon as you walk into the main hall, will present you with such a vertical scroll, which occupies a very important, very central position, precisely because of the importance of its philosophical underpinnings. It's about, you know, uh, three or four meters high, an extremely tall painting. And what does it represent? Is this uh, simply uh, depicting reality? Is there really a place like this? Of course there isn't. But it seems to you as if in your memory you had been in a place like this. And if you go to a mountain and you wander around this mountain for three or four days and look around at every nook and cranny and afterwards you want to represent your experience, well perhaps you will paint something like this, something which records all of the things you have seen in different places, at different points in time, uh, 
and space over the past few days. But it's very uh, important to respect this constraint of being able to represent this in two-dimensional space. So that I find it is particularly interesting to look at this as an architect. How can we uh, achieve such a thing? Wander around uh, for three days in an area and then find a way to express what we have experienced. If it can be done by painters, then architects should be able to do it too. Let's look a little more closely at this picture. So, this kind of picture clearly illustrates an interest, a kind of contemplative meditation of Guan Xiang. The idea then is back then for uh, those uh, who did this to wander around without a particular, a specific aim in mind and take in the landscape. Here you can see, uh, for example, uh, the uh, teacher uh, who is wandering in the mountains with his uh, assistant. There he is uh, with uh, his assistant and uh, a teacher uh, from the old days, the assistant carrying uh, a box with books so that if the teacher wants to sit down and uh, read for a while, he can do so before he continues with his roamings. Almost uh, all uh, uh, intellectuals in China have a passion for such uh, activities. So let's take uh, a fresh look at this painting. I've drawn a red line halfway up, and this introduces a, an interesting point. If you look at the upper half, first of all, this is what he is thinking about. In uh, simple terms, uh, we can see uh, that uh, uh, you know, at the bottom of the painting, there is uh, a house where the teacher is sitting and he's thinking about something. And what we have at the top here is not a real landscape, but rather a philosophical one. What he is thinking about, and the interesting point here is that both of these things can be represented synchronously in the same painting. Now that is something interesting it seems to me. I often find myself thinking, you know, how could I possibly make uh, an architectural project that would achieve the same effect and express something philosophical at the same time as it fulfills its function? So uh, this is probably an interesting way uh, to approach the interrelationships between the present and the past. Rather than looking at the differences between uh, the present and tradition, I think it's interesting to look at these interrelationships. This is another example. You can see a very curious looking mountain at the top and at the bottom, uh, a house in which there is someone. And what you can see is that this person is not just thinking about what you see at the top. The way that things are represented at the bottom with such extreme precision uh, illustrates the concept of guanxiang. It's not just about metaphysical, philosophical, abstract things. What you have at the bottom is the interrelationship with real life, flowers, trees, the way that this fence has been made out of uh, bamboo and uh, the great precision with which it has been depicted. So this is not just a matter of representing reality, but also the things that you paid particular attention to in the overall process of observation. It's exactly the same thing as what we saw with the long horizontal scrolls that we find in these vertical scrolls. The fact that you cannot leave aside or forget the details, nor can you afford to lose track of the overall picture of the more lofty images which we see at the top here. And rather than to approach them separately, you can approach them simultaneously. So this uh, leads us to a notion of time. 
uh, which appears, for example, in this painting here. This is also from a, a grand master of some 1,000 years ago. And I have a feeling I talked about this painting already the last time I spoke here. But let's look at it again. On the left here, uh, we are lost deep in the mountains, in the countryside. That's the left half of the painting. And if you look more closely, uh, you can see that it's not the kind of uh, faraway mountainous region where no one could possibly live. There are, of course, some very uh, high forbidding uh, mountains, uh, but there are also more welcoming areas uh, at their feet, and it looks as if uh, there are ways of getting around. As for this part, this is uh, what we could describe um, as uh, the urban area. The idea here is that what you see on the left, the faraway mountains, expresses the place from where we came, our past, in other words. But for Chinese people, the city, the town, urban areas are never seen as a place where you could live forever on a lasting basis. You come there uh, to become an official, to make some money, and there's no other way than to be there for a while. But the ultimate aim is to return to the countryside, so that uh, the town represents the present, neither the past nor the future, just the present, and that's an important point. So, there is a tremendous amount of uh, poetry in this way of thinking about this. After uh, we uh, saw our country weakened uh, over the past hundred years and were bullied and pushed around uh, for some time, uh, we wanted to build our nation into a great nation again. And the question after all this, is whether we have lost that sense of poetry or not. Which brings us to a number of fresh questions. Questions like the ones you see here. And people have the most uh, animated discussions about these issues. But uh, most people feel that ultimately it's difficult to actually get down to work. Of course, we can debate these things, but uh, there are a few people who will actually try to tackle the issues. So what I would like to turn to in the second part of my presentation is my own work and how I go about it. How can you bring back uh, the poetry into construction and architecture? As we talk about philosophical issues and uh, debates, we mustn't forget the bamboo fences either. Uh, we must pull together philosophy, poetry, and the craft of the craftsman, the materials that we use. How do you pull these things together? That is at the heart of my work. Most of uh, what uh, we work with uh, is ruins. And you have some examples here of uh, demolition sites uh, which uh, uh, are forever uh, devouring up uh, new uh, buildings and districts. And that this is the kind of uh, ruin that you see everywhere. And uh, it's very interesting uh, to look at them. When I uh, contemplate these places, I have my own way of thinking. I mean, of course, you could say, well, what a pity that it's so run down. Well, of course, it is a pity, but it doesn't stop there. Uh, if you look, for example, at the way that both earth and bricks have been used, uh, and also at the way that this is such a very real illustration of the way the world changes, and the world has changed. So, I think it, my approach would not consist in saying, oh, well, let's just renovate this and make it all fresh and new again and stop there. Rather, I would prefer to think about it and to see what I can learn from the experience of reflecting upon uh, this reality. In fact, I love to take my classes, my students, out into uh, the ruins or uh, demolition sites uh, which uh, have been 
uh, set aside, we can learn many things from what we see there. It's a little bit like a sick uh, patient at the hospital who's uh, operated upon and uh, who medical students come to visit. So what exactly can we do faced with all this? At the beginning of the 1990s, we were filled with a, a sense of despair to a certain degree. Uh, intellectuals ultimately felt that ultimately the only choice for them was uh, to move away and live a secluded life and just say, well, I just don't want to play by the rules of this modern life. I'll go off and live my own life. So, uh, near the West Lake, uh, there was a period of some five years uh, where I uh, lived uh, a kind of secluded life in the mountains, enjoying uh, uh, the landscapes and roaming around. But ultimately, uh, I felt that the time had come to return to the real world. And I couldn't afford to say, no, I just don't want to play. I don't want to have anything to do with uh, this modern era. And ultimately, I came back, uh, I went to uh, Shanghai, uh, Tongji University, and uh, did a PhD there, fundamentally so that I would be able to get back to work. It wasn't for the PhD itself, it was so that I could get back to work. So what can we do then? One thing that I find particularly interesting is that uh, in China, this, this tradition of uh, philosophical debate about uh, nature uh, becomes all the more uh, interesting, in a sense, in the context of this era of modern development. There are many things that we can learn uh, from tradition, which I believe can help us uh, to solve some of the issues that stem from the accelerated growth of uh, cities and the many problems which are so difficult to solve today. Uh, let's take a look at another painting from about a thousand years ago. And when people say, China, well, this, this is the kind of image that comes to mind. That is China for you. But is this something that you can still experience today? Uh, this is uh, a series of photographs that we took a couple of years ago of walking around in the countryside in Zhejiang province. And uh, we were delighted to find that indeed you can still find uh, some scenes, some settings which remind you of the painting we saw from a thousand years ago, so that it is still possible to do something about the situation. That's a very important thing. This is a picture uh, to illustrate the fact that I often take my students uh, with me uh, to go out and investigate uh, uh, in uh, the countryside. Uh, we have uh, uh, carried out investigations in more than 200 different uh, villages over the past few years, and we've learned huge amounts from all of that. There would be much uh, to talk about here. Uh, but you can see uh, that the uh, traditions from a thousand years ago uh, have not uh, vanished. They have not become uh, a thing of the past. They are still very much alive, as you can see here. And, uh, in fact, everywhere you turn, you can see examples of uh, things uh, which uh, for the past uh, 2,000 years have been happening. There are traces of all the things that happened over the past 2,000 years. And as an architect, uh, this is something which can be a source of great happiness to see that all of this history is materialized in the structures around you. Another very important thing is that, of course, people made all of these buildings. Traditionally, there is no such thing as an architect. There were scholars and there were craftsmen. That was the tradition. Now, uh, the scholars were all uh, uh, destroyed uh, by 
uh, revolutionary movements. So uh, what we have left is uh, the craftsmen. One of the great achievements of the revolution has been uh, to get rid of all the scholars, but what uh, has survived is the craftsmen. And I find it very interesting to go and talk with the craftsmen. I think that is really the only way forward to ensure that we can uh, consolidate the continuity of Chinese tradition. One of the interesting things is that despite uh, the extreme wealth and complexity of structures, it all starts from the simplest of things, a piece of bamboo, a few bricks, uh, the bamboo stick, which can be used to measure and to begin your work. So we've carried out a lot of uh, investigations, for example, on wooden structures over a period of three months. Uh, every week uh, we go out uh, to record and investigate. For example, this was a wooden structure, and we uh, learned a lot from observing the way that the craftsmen went about their work, uh, the tools that they used, uh, what kinds uh, of uh, rulers uh, they used. Uh, we found, for example, uh, uh, that uh, uh, they were uh, making marks on bamboo sticks uh, to use them as rulers uh, and to measure uh, the wooden parts. And the way uh, that all of the structural elements had little inscriptions, little notes written on them. What were all of these notes? The fact is that uh, the actual assembly process to build, to construct this wooden structure only took a week and there was a long preparation period uh, before that uh, during which uh, they were doing something very uh, simple, which is, of course, you have these very clear principles in traditional construction techniques. However, the principles are clear, uh, but uh, the materials themselves are extremely irregular and do not follow these very square orthogonal principles. There are uh, some 200 different rulers that were used to try to bring these irregular materials into line. And after that preparatory process, it was quick to assemble everything. Of course, in principle, you should have something straight, but then in practice, the piece of wood is actually uh, a very irregular shape. The shape of the materials is forever changing. And that is something which I think is very interesting about Chinese traditional construction techniques. How do you adapt these rules, these principles, to the very irregular and unpredictable character of the materials you're working with? And these carpenters may not know a very large number of Chinese characters. They may be semi-illiterate, in fact, but they will always find a solution. They will always find a workaround. And this led me to realize that tradition is not just what we are familiar with, uh, these things from the past exclusively. But here we have something with which we can actually engage, interrelate. So that uh, ultimately, I think we need to change ourselves as architects, too. Uh, it is very important uh, to realize uh, that present-day architects simply do not have the wherewithal to do these things without the craftsmen. And the only way uh, to improve on this situation, since we have not had these traditions passed on to us by our teachers, is to learn them as best we can. You can see uh, the man uh, in uh, white here uh, is a craftsman that I've worked with for some 10 years or so in uh, craft in Hangzhou. Uh, I myself and my wife uh, also uh, uh, go up on this uh, structure that you see here, which we were uh, building for the uh, Venice 
of Vienna, and uh, people were amazed uh, that uh, uh, in the space of just about two weeks we were able to assemble this uh, with uh, uh, 5,000 bamboo rods, 60,000 tiles, which are six architects, three workmen, to build a 800 square meter structure in the space of 13 days only. This is what I call self-education, self-change. It's not something uh, that you can find uh, from theory. I prefer to find ways that we can pull together the theory with the practice. And there are so many things that would be extremely difficult to put into words that you can experience in the field when you're actually working with people on the spur of the moment. When you're faced with situations, with the materials themselves, then it comes to you how you could actually use them, how you could put them to use. So when you're out in the field, the direct experience that you have is something uh, which cannot be substituted for with mere descriptions. So, over the past few years, uh, our basic working methodology has been uh, to uh, carry out a number of uh, experimental projects moving from smaller scale to larger scale things. Uh, I do not see myself as, a, as an artist in my work as an architect, someone who would make one or two uh, works which people would admire and then I would be happy with that. Rather, I want to uh, be able uh, to adapt to urban change, to the pace of development, and not just be satisfied with one or two things. I think uh, that if we want to actually have any influence over the shape that things are taking, we need to move to a greater scale and have larger numbers of projects. Otherwise, people won't be able to really grasp the fact that it is possible to go about the work in this way. We need to convince them that it is possible. So there are a lot of experimental projects. For example, these five uh, scattered houses in Ningbo. So this was an investigation uh, into the materials. And uh, you can see uh, here uh, that uh, we were looking at uh, the way that uh, bricks uh, could be uh, used for constructions, the way of laying the bricks uh, traditionally. And uh, we uh, built a number of uh, models to scale uh, to see what we could do. And of course, uh, you know, the craftsmen very often can do this when they're working on a model, uh, but when they get to the actual project, there's an issue of scale, the sheer magnitude, uh, where suddenly they find themselves uh, unable uh, to proceed. And then we have to get into discussions uh, with the craftsmen and see how uh, we can pull together uh, the overall uh, system, the overall setup, with the actual materials so that we can move forward. So here you have the contrast between inside and outside a small gallery. And this is another example of uh, the way that we could work with iron and uh, brick. But the fact is that every architect has to work with the actual proprietor and with uh, the project owner, and you have to ensure that you are able to gain the trust of all the players so that the experiments play a very important part. Now, some people may th say that I'm an idealist and that the things that I want to do essentially can't be done, that it's all utopian. So, what we try to do is to show people that ultimately utopia can become reality. That's the first step. Now, this 
is uh, the uh, Xiangshan campus of the China Academy of Art. Uh, the Architecture Institute where I teach is on Xiangshan campus. Uh, we uh, built it uh, over the period 2003-2007. You can see where it is located uh, in uh, the mountains uh, to the southwest of Hangzhou. And uh, uh, you can see the West Lake up here next to Hangzhou. That's it there, the West Lake. And we are over here. It's about half an hour's drive uh, from West Lake. And there's a little hill there called uh, Xiangshan, which is about 50 meters high, surrounded by paddy fields, uh, which are very ordinary. Now, as I approached this project, I was thinking about how you could uh, approach a large-scale uh, project taking into account the interrelationship and the harmony between buildings and landscape, which we find in tradition. Uh, this is uh, an example of uh, uh, a map of uh, Lu Town, uh, which uh, is from a couple of hundred years ago. It's very interesting to note the way that it has a very distributed, uh, scattered layout, and that nothing stands out as particularly important. Uh, this is uh, an example also of the way that an old village uh, interrelates with the surrounding countryside, uh, the mountain, and so forth. And you can see uh, examples of this uh, in Europe. Uh, very often there would be uh, 5,000 people. This is uh, a quick uh, master plan sketch uh, that I drew. I tried uh, to establish interrelationships with uh, traditional paintings. And you can see, for example, over here on the left, a very far away view of uh, the village. And on the right, uh, a point of view where you really are inside the mountains. And uh, you can deal with these concurrently. You can see uh, uh, the overall view, uh, the finer details, and also the way that uh, as you move from uh, the sketches, the drawings, to the actual building, there are many uh, subtle details that come into account. And it seems to me uh, that uh, when it comes to uh, the master plan, in fact, a well-known architect uh, in China said to me, you know, this is a very strange-looking master plan. It, it, it really looks quite bizarre. But when he came to visit the site, he, uh, he was won over, and he felt that it was very appropriately thought out. And, and this brings us back to that notion of uh, the way that you can reflect upon the way everything fits together and not just the interrelationships between uh, the various buildings but how uh, they can be in harmony with their surroundings. These are some steps which uh, remind me essentially of the same idea. The ways that we do uh, things nowadays can perhaps be associated with the old way of doing things. This is an old stone uh, staircase, and uh, uh, the craftsman here built a cement uh, and stone bridge. But it seems to me that it fits in very nicely. In fact, it's, uh, it's a very interesting uh, little bridge. And uh, it's an example of the fact that it's not always necessary to stick strictly to traditional methods and approaches. It looks as if, unfortunately, I'm starting to run out of time, so I'm going to have to speed up a little bit. Here you have a few shots, a few different uh, views that illustrate uh, the interrelationships between the surrounding countryside, landscape, and the buildings, uh, with some uh, uh, front and side views, uh, 
of uh, the facade of the, the buildings uh, and also uh, the way that these um, uh, flying passageways run across uh, the buildings. Uh, an American uh, friend, when uh, he came, said, you know, if you look at that little hill at Xiangshan, it's anything, uh, it's extremely ordinary, but suddenly it seems as if it it came into existence as a result of you building this campus around it. And at the time, I was a little tongue-tied at this idea. It seems to me that uh, there's a great sense of philosophy in what he said, and that it was right. It suddenly, by virtue of interrelating with the things around it, this mountain takes on a certain poignancy of its own, and it is the interaction of the different elements that produces that effect. <coughs> so these are uh, some views of the Institute of Architecture. I was uh, uh, talking earlier about uh, the interrelationship between different scales, the overall view and the details. And in uh, present day, architecture. Uh, in fact, in the history of Chinese architecture, we always need to think about uh, not just the question of traditional materials, uh, but other architectural issues as well. Generally speaking, traditional uh, architecture uh, it, it works very well on a small scale, but when you get to very large scale things, it becomes very difficult uh, to move forward, and uh, uh, people find themselves paralyzed. This is uh, uh, a little exercise of joining together a number of different shots taken around the campus uh, for you to experience uh, the feeling of the place and perhaps gain a sense of uh, of what uh, I was trying to achieve uh, here. It, it, it goes beyond uh, what we usually talk about. It's also about the interrelation between the inside and the outside, between different scales. And uh, it's about uh, the methods that I've been describing, the ones that you find in traditional uh, Chinese paintings, or at least something similar, because Otherwise, uh, you know, how can you represent uh, an extremely large mountain that covers uh, a thousand kilometers in a single painting? Well, uh, in uh, uh, a town uh, or a city, how do we approach this issue of the landscape and the perspectives and views, the interrelationships, which I have been describing? I, I, I have been trying to describe the uh, thinking process which goes into approaching these issues. And, of course, there are many other considerations, uh, technical, uh, environmental, and so forth. If you use uh, traditional materials, uh, this provides uh, uh, some advantages, of course, and uh, we can uh, find solutions which enable us uh, to remedy the fact that it's uh, very hot in the summer, very cold in in the winter, or vice versa, and uh, this uh, can enable us uh, to move forward. This is uh, the wall which was on the uh, invitation uh, to uh, this conference today, uh, which uh, includes some 7 million bricks and tiles. And there were many learning opportunities, teaching opportunities here with workshops, uh, which we organized around various aspects of the work. Everyone is uh, presumably familiar with the Ningbo uh, History Museum. I will not dwell upon this uh, because uh, I think uh, we've had opportunities to uh, talk about it before. Uh, the thing is, uh, you know, again, uh, when it comes to uh, this utopian accusation. Some people will say you can only talk about these things in the classroom, but when you have an enormous building, 30,000 square meters with 
government investment, well, it's very seldom that you have opportunities uh, like this one, uh, where you can show uh, that it is possible to make utopian things a reality and even uh, to gain uh, acceptance and enthusiasm from society. Uh, the local people really like this building. In fact, all of the traditional buildings in the area have already been destroyed, and the only way that they can uh, find a connection, a way to reconnect with their memories, is through projects like this. And over the past few years, of course, I have had opportunities to work on a number of different projects. The most important was probably the Hangzhou Zhongshan Road uh, Conservation and Regeneration uh, Plan. Uh, this uh, was uh, a project which uh, reached a level of, of complexity which I had not been confronting with before. Here you can see a map uh, from the Southern Song uh, Dynasty, and uh, you can see uh, Zhongshan Lu was a very important street uh, that the emperor used to travel up and down, which was the central axis here on the map. The uh, stretch of street uh, of Zhongshan Road concerned is six kilometers long. Here you have a couple of old shots of Hangzhou. Uh, this is uh, what the street looked like before the project. It was really very uh, neglected. Uh, everything was uh, uh, falling apart. Uh, and there was a government official who, uh, when we were talking about this, uh, was asking me how I could possibly go about this, given the degree of uh, uh, neglect which uh, these buildings uh, had uh, uh, been left to fall into. He really had no idea how I could possibly uh, go about it. But I think that thanks to uh, a deeper understanding of our traditions and culture, we can move towards a different approach to these projects. In a case like this, of course, uh, the proprietor, the owner, is the government. And I set out some very clear conditions. Uh, the first was uh, that uh, I had to have time. I had to have at least six months to be able to investigate and do research in depth before uh, the actual design stage. And uh, indeed, over a period of six years, a number of uh, construction and design uh, entities uh, had carried out uh, uh, various studies, uh, but the officials were not convinced. They felt that uh, uh, it just didn't fit, and they came to see me. We had uh, a little meeting in which I expressed uh, uh, some views, and a week later, to my surprise, uh, they decided to uh, put the whole project into my hands. So at that point, I said, okay, no matter how urgent, how pressing this project might be, I need half a year to work out all the details and investigate in depth the ins and outs of the issues. I will have no part in the project if it involves any kind of forced relocation of the residents. That is an essential condition. Thirdly, uh, I refuse to be involved in knocking down old buildings and building fresh ones which are fake antiques, as we call them. I want no parts of that. The fourth point is that very often, uh, for the sake of speed, uh, the officials in China on such projects opt for just renovation of the facades of the buildings. But I wanted to also renovate the insides of the buildings. Also, it was not just a matter of preserving tradition. In fact, as I see it, tradition must be a living thing so that it can continue to develop in people's lives. And it's only normal that there should be room for new buildings uh, to emerge. If new buildings cannot appear, then you are faced with a dead thing. And it's important to leave space for that to happen.
In fact, uh, the planning department uh, of the city had uh, widened the street uh, to 24 meters from the old 12 meters in many places. So I was asking whether it would be possible to add a few new buildings uh, so that we could bring uh, the whole stretch of that street back to the original 12 meters so that it would be a more pleasant uh, pedestrian area. Now, this was a six kilometer stretch and we were given only two years. I felt that the amateur architecture studio would not be able to cover the whole thing. We had to restrict ourselves to just one kilometer of these six and ask others in uh, to take part in the overall project and just break it up into uh, separate parts. So we invited a number of people from Tongji University, Southeast University, Nanjing University, Beijing University, a number of young teachers about uh, 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 taken along with us. We must have been about 30 uh, teachers, uh, uh, a group which uh, uh, distributed uh, the overall project into a number of sub projects. And I was afraid of losing control over uh, the overall uh, project. So I took responsibility with Amateur Architecture Studio for the central segment that you see here. And these are uh, some shots of uh, the way that uh, construction work uh, takes place in China. You can't knock down all buildings, you might say, but then uh, you realize that all the local residents actually hope that they'll be able to knock them down because then they can get compensation uh, from uh, the government. Uh, and the authorities themselves are all in favor of that solution because it costs more uh, to renovate the buildings than uh, to just knock them down and build a new one. So from one day to the next, you might see that a building has simply disappeared. And the justification provided is that uh, the foundations were too close to those of the neighboring building for the construction to proceed. So it's a continual struggle. Uh, you have to uh, fight tooth and nail uh, to try to take things in the direction you want. And local residents were very interested in this project. They were always uh, coming and going, watching uh, new developments and complaining left and right, going to the municipal authorities, all the way up to the provincial authorities uh, to lodge complaints. And you can see uh, here uh, a few uh, very innovative ways of doing things. Things may look very haphazard in China, the way that things come about, but some very novel uh, results can emerge from this apparent chaos. It's perhaps a characteristic of China. So this is uh, the street. This is the part that a teacher from Tongji University in Shanghai did. This is a young teacher from our uh, institute's uh, part. That part on the left I did. This uh, Southeast University on the top left. Uh, but the central part was my responsibility. And one of the major changes was that I turned this street into uh, partly uh, a garden so that it looked like this. And once the work was completed, uh, the uh, uh, reaction uh, that ultimately uh, the residents had was something that the mayor was very worried about. He had no idea how they would react. And he said, you know, uh, Wang Shu, we will sink or swim together. And, uh, uh, you know, I wanted to bring back water into the street. A number of people were against this. And to add some modern elements, a lot of people were against that as well. Who would have thought that uh, within a week we had more than a million visitors after the project was completed? And uh, this street, which had been forgotten by everyone, became very animated with lots of visitors day in, day out. Look at this old lady. I mean, to me, uh, this is the ultimate criterion uh, to assess the success of the project. Here she is uh, sitting, uh, standing in her doorway with a wide grin, delighted that she's still living in her original house. So this is not just a question of construction materials. It has also to do uh, with time, with memory, uh, with many, many different things.
a traditional view of Hangzhou from about a thousand years ago, and this is a, a new uh, element that I added uh, myself, and it's interesting to think about tradition in these terms. Uh, uh, very often, uh, you know, we find that we're not uh, really sure what we're talking about, and people were asking, well, what exactly is this supposed to be? What could it possibly mean? And, uh, you know, if you look at this painting, you won't find rocks like that on uh, the banks of the West Lake. The fact is, there are no such rocks there. But the painter was thinking in imaginative ways about nature. So it was not just a straightforward matter of representing what was there, nor is tradition something which is set in stone. So I think it's very important uh, to pay very close attention to the finer details. Uh, for example, uh, this is uh, a small building uh, where I uh, paid very close attention uh, to the details. Uh, this is uh, a technique uh, which is part of a tradition which in fact has been lost in China. And there were uh, 10 different groups of craftsmen who tried to do this until ultimately we found one which was able uh, to achieve what we wanted. In fact, the workers only took three months to build this small museum. It was done extremely fast. And uh, it seems to me that uh, the quality is very good. It, it's an illustration ultimately about uh, the way that architects and craftsmen uh, can work together in China. Uh, the learned people may have lost touch with tradition, but the craftsmen have not. Mm. And to me that is uh, very interesting. Here are some, some shots. I really like this project. So this is our uh, amateur architecture studio with some of our young assistants. All of these uh, changes, uh, you know, began some 10 years ago uh, with uh, some of my uh, projects in uh, Hangzhou. You know, every day I would uh, paint uh, with a brush, I would uh, make notes and draw with a pencil, and uh, mentally I was always uh, picturing these scenes, uh, these settings, and trying to achieve a basic Understanding. And I feel that as an architect, you may build something new, but it's important that things which already existed are still there and have become of this new building, which is not just purely and simply a new building. Thank you for your attention.